Yes, how are you? Oh, you're so nice. You are so nice. Hi, my name is Ed Frawley. This is my dog, Anna. I own Learbird Kennels. I have owned German Shepherds since 1957, and in the last 25 years, I've bred them, probably over 300 litters. In the early 1980s, I competed in AKC obedience competitions, uh, AKC tracking competitions. Uh, I put a number of Schutzen titles on various dogs, and I've trained police service dogs for 10 years. I was a canine handler on our local sheriff's department. The only reason that I tell you these things is because if you've not already found out, you shortly will, that everyone you talk to is going to have an opinion on how to train your dog. Unfortunately, most people don't have the experience to back up these opinions. The information that I'm going to give you in this training tape is good, solid information. There's a lot of information here. My training video is not designed to be watched once. In fact, you need to watch it again and again and again because every time you watch it, you're going to pick up a new idea. Your dogs wake up every morning wanting to be loved. They want to be your friend and in most cases they want to please you. The job of an owner is to learn how to communicate with his dog so the dog feels secure and so the dog knows that he must mind. I compare the relationship between a dog and an owner as the same as between a child and a parent or the same as an employee and a boss where you have a relationship with the boss that uh, is a friendly relationship. I'm often asked by people uh, what my opinion is of obedience classes. I think that there's a place for obedience classes. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a good idea to take your dog through a formal obedience class unless the training is correct. The problem with obedience classes are a great many still train in an old-fashioned uh, in the old-fashioned way where they give the dog the command to heal and then they jerk it on a leash. Uh, crank and jerk methods went out the door a long long time ago. You will see in our video here we're going to teach you how to train your dog with motivation. We're going to show you different ways to motivate your dog to want to do what you tell them to do. The basic goal of this video is to teach you how to make your dog become a safe member of your family pack. We want a dog that enjoys training. We want a dog to be calm, be self-controlled, yet mind when we ask him to mind. This is not rocket science. You're going to find out that a lot of it is simple common sense. I'm often asked by people if the methods that I use in dog training will work on their breed of dog. It's a very common question. The fact is that, is that good dog training is not breed specific. Dog training is temperament and drive specific. And by that I mean if a dog has a solid temperament, if he's a friendly dog, if he has good drives, we train all those dogs the same way. We vary the training according to the temperament and drive. And in this video, you're going to learn how to evaluate the temperament of a dog how to evaluate the drive level of a dog, and then how to modify the training to fit the temperament and drive of your dog. You don't train every dog the same. The fact is, you don't train any two dogs the same because no two dogs are exactly alike. It should be the goal of every dog owner to try and figure out how to train their dog to make their dog enjoy the work. And I think we're gonna help you learn how to do that in this training video. One of the things that I'd like to mention at this point in the tape is as you watch this tape I'm going to provide you with uh, web addresses for various articles that I've written on my website that pertain to this portion of the video. Uh, if you want to do a little bit of research go on my website. At the time that I'm producing this training video, my website is well over 3,500 pages. And I also have a web discussion board 
that has over 4,000 registered members. I've set my board up so that you can go and look at the various topics and the various threads from the very beginning of the board until the time that you look at and read it. There's a tremendous amount of information on my website, so don't let this videotape be the end of your dog training. Take advantage of going and reading the articles that I've written because I go into an awful lot more detail in these articles than we have time for here in this training video. I want to take a second here and talk about drive and a little bit about temperament. Drive is the desire to do something. When we have a dog that has a lot of prey drive, this is a dog that really likes to chase a ball. In narcotics work, we have to have intense drive. And by that, I mean we need to have a dog that would rather play with a tennis ball than eat or sleep or do anything else. As a narcotics dog trainer, we take that drive and we channel it into locating drugs. That's the way it works. We hide the drugs. The dog learns that if it finds the drugs, it gets to play with the tennis ball. The same thing goes with food drive. A dog that will do anything for a little bit of hot dog has a very high food drive. Some dogs have very little interest in food. If you offer them food and see what they'll do for it, they can take it or leave it. That dog has a low food drive. Temperament is a little different. Temperament is like the personality of your dog. Dogs are like people. They have different temperaments. No two dogs are alike. No two dogs are trained exactly the same. Uh, we in the dog world define dogs as hard dogs or soft dogs. A soft dog is a dog that does not recuperate quickly from a correction. You often see or hear of people saying, boy, I correct my dog and it acts like I just killed it. Well, that's a dog that's a soft temperamented dog. A hard dog, on the other hand, is a dog that when you give it a normal correction, it looks at you and says, is that the best you can give? I don't need to do that. I can take that and more. We're going to teach you and talk about in this video how to deal with hard and soft dogs. One of the things that, that new trainers need to learn is that the hardness and the softness of a dog is directly influenced by the drive the dog is in. In other words, I rate corrections on a level of one to level 10. A soft dog may need to have a correction at level one, two, or three. But when that same dog is in drive, and drive is not influenced by hardness or softness, you can have a very soft dog that has very intense drive. That's an important thing to understand. I've seen some very soft police service dogs, dogs that when the handler gives them a strong voice correction will hit the ground, but also these same soft police dogs will bite a bad guy every time and bite them hard. So back to what I was saying, we're going to teach you that drive, when a dog is higher in drive, his level of softness and hardness changes. The higher a dog is in drive, the, ha the harder that dog will be. So a soft dog that may need a level one, two, or three correction in normal work, when it's high in drive, may have to have a fo level four or level five correction. And the same thing goes for a hard dog. If you have a normally a hard dog that's trained at level seven in correction and you put him in drive, he may have to have a level nine uh, or possibly a level 10 correction to make him mind you. So it's important that you give some thought to the hardness and the softness of your dog and we're going to talk in the training of how to determine that. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about are the nerves of your dog. Dogs have different levels of nerves. When we talk about nerves in the dog world, we're talking about dogs that have weak nerves or dogs that have solid nerves. Uh, a dog with solid nerves enjoys life. He can go to new environments. He can meet people. He has no problems meeting people. Uh, an example can be a gunshot can go off over here and, and a dog would ignore it, a dog with good nerves. A dog with weak nerves is a nervous dog. A dog with weak nerves is a dog that is quick to get his hair up uh, when, a, when he comes near a stranger. He's a dog that's quick to shy away from things that he's not 100% sure of. He's a dog that 
when you take him downtown, if a car drives by and backfires, he's got, the dog's going to try and get behind you because he's scared. A dog that acts afraid in certain situations is a dog that has weak nerves. How nerves relate to your training is something we're going to talk about later. Keep in mind that as we go through training, uh, you have to give some thought to the nerves of your dog. One of the things I will point out is that dogs with weak nerves respond very well to obedience training because a dog that has weak nerves wants to be in a position where it feels comfortable. So if we do our job right and motivate a weak nerve dog and show him, teach him through motivation what we want, that dog wants to please you very well. It doesn't like to be nervous. It wants to do the right thing. So weak nerve dogs can respond very well to good obedience training. The learning process that a dog goes through when we're doing our training is a three-stage process. There's a learning phase where we teach the dog what the exercise is through motivation. There's a, dis there's a correction phase where once the dog knows the exercise, if he refuses to do it, we correct him for not doing it. And there's the distraction phase. The distraction phase is initially we do our training in the house, in our backyard, and we teach the dog that he must do what we tell him to do. In the distraction phase, we, we raise the level of distractions. Here is where we take the dog away from the house, down to the park, to the supermarket, wherever, where there are increasing levels of distraction and the dogs then learn that they must mind even when there are other things that they would like to do. I get about a hundred to uh, 125 emails every day. One of the most common things I get uh, in emails are problems that develop when people say I've taken my dog through obedience class and he minds but when I take him away from home and we're in the park this happens or that happens or when I have to go to a relative's house and I want my dog to mind he won't mind these are examples of dogs that have not gone through a distraction phase the learning phase of training is one of the most important phases in the learning phase we teach a dog the meaning of a command with motivation either for food or a toy or in rare cases just praise from the handler in other words, we teach it that when we say a word, for example, sit, it means put your butt on the ground. I tell people it's like teaching a dog the English language. Experiments have been done that show the average dog has to perform an exercise 30 times before it learns the exercise. It takes a human seven repeatings before they learn an exercise. I call this the rule of 30. The learning phase is an area where many new trainers often mistakenly cut short. They lose their patience and they assume, after repeating an exercise 15 or 20 times, that the dog should know what they're asking them to do. So they move the dog into the correction and distraction phase. When this happens, we have a bad situation because dogs are being corrected for something that they don't know what they did wrong. Dogs get confused, they get depressed, and in some cases they get mad. Doing this is detrimental to the relationship between the dog and the handler. When you stop and think about it, this is really unfair for the dog. I compare it to a boss who's teaching you how to operate a very complicated piece of machinery. He repeats himself two times to show you how to run the machinery, and then when you make a mistake, he verbally reprimands you and sends you home for the day. How fair is that? Well, the same thing goes for you and your dog. Only with the dog, people are giving physical corrections with a leash and a collar when the dog does something that they don't even understand what they're getting corrected for. Think about it for a second. It's like the boss cuffing you behind the head when you make a mistake. Dogs should only be corrected for refusing to do something that you are 110% sure he knows how to do. Anything less than that is cruel. The next thing we want to talk about is distractions with your dog. Remember what we talked about at the very beginning of the tape. Dogs have a 
a learning phase, a correction phase, and a distraction phase. And a lot of times, the correction phase and the distraction phase uh, go hand in hand. I tell new trainers to try and compare distractions to corrections. Let's establish a level one through level 10 distraction. It's important that you understand that like corrections, distractions vary from dog to dog. It's not breed specific, it's not age specific, uh, it's not size specific. It varies from one dog to another dog. With one dog, simply touching the dog can be a distraction. Your voice can be a distraction. Your praise, the level of praise that you use can be a distraction. Some dogs just need to have, that's fine. And that same dog, a distraction would be, oh, that's good, that's good. That's a distraction for the dog. So you need to really analyze how your dog reacts to see what changes his level of drive to understand distractions. Simply moving a little bit could be a distraction for your dog. Let's use, a, let's use an example here of a dog in a downstay. You moving a little bit, taking one step, may be enough of a distraction to cause that dog to move. And if it moves, it then needs a normal correction. Now. A higher level of distraction could be your wife walking out into the backyard and this is more of a distraction than you just taking a step. A higher level of distraction could, you, could be you dropping a ball behind you or you, there's a difference in levels of distraction from you just dropping a ball to showing the dog a ball versus throwing a ball. The higher level of distraction, the higher you have to increase your level of corrections. What you need to do is really sit down someday, give some serious thought to your dog and say, okay, these are the different levels of distraction that I have to work with. When I tell people how to train it, start with a low level of distraction. In the downstay, maybe you just walking in a circle around him is a big, big step for distractions for him. Or you taking two steps back or three steps back is a big level of distraction for him. So gradually increase your levels of distraction. Get it to the point where you can work in your backyard where you control the distractions that your dog is introduced to. And when your dog can work in your backyard under all the distractions that you can think of, then it's time to maybe take him to the front yard. Or then it's time to maybe take him to the park early in the morning when nobody's there. So, think in terms of training and a training schedule as to levels of distraction. This section of the video deals with uh, corrections and how to administer corrections to your dog. Anyone can go out and correct a dog. That's easy to do. But it takes some education to learn how to do it properly. Uh, you need to understand what kind of a collar to use on that specific dog. You need to know when to give a correction, what to give a correction for, and how hard to give a correction for that specific dog and what he's doing at that exact time. This section is gonna talk a little bit about that to help educate you on corrections. I tell people that there are three kinds of corrections. The first is, I just killed you in a correction. The second is the ouch correction. And the third is the mosquito bite correction. Very seldom will you ever give an I killed you correction. And I killed you correction is a correction that takes the drive completely out of the dog. I, and I killed you correction on a soft dog makes the dog tuck his tail between his legs and lay down on the ground and he won't play with a toy, he won't eat a food reward, he just acts like he just died. A mosquito bite correction 
is what a lot of people do. I call it a nagging correction. People give little foo-foo, these little taps or pulls like that, and they mean nothing to the dog. I tell people it's better to give one good correction rather than a thousand nagging corrections. One good correction is going to make your dog pay attention and think about what he's doing the next time he thinks about making a mistake again. Now the big question, how do you figure out how hard to correct your dog? How do you figure out where your dog's ouch correction, which is the level that we want to use, is? This is accomplished by doing some experimenting. Before I talk about that though, I have to tell you that every dog is different. So what your neighbor may say, well my dog has to be corrected at this level, has nothing at all to do with your dog. The level of correction that you use on a dog has nothing to do with the breed of the dog, nothing to do with the sex of the dog, nothing to do with the age of the dog, and nothing to do with the size of the dog. How hard you correct a dog is dependent on the temperament of the dog. Is the dog a hard dog? Is the dog a soft dog? A hard dog is a dog that when you give him a correction, he looks at you and he says, is that the best you can do? A soft dog is a dog when you give him a correction, a normal correction, they hit the ground, tuck their tail, and act like you just beat him to death. So you need to start by experimenting with corrections to see where your dog's ouch correction is. Start at level two or level three. Not much of a correction. When the correction isn't hard enough, the dog won't stop doing what you want him to stop doing. He may stop for a second or so, maybe give you just a second of eye contact, and then go right back to doing what he was doing. That's not a hard enough correction. I want to administer a correction that will stop the dog from doing what he was doing before. I want the dog to remember next time, I better stop this or I'm going to get a correction like I got last time. And the correction can't be so hard that the dog will just shut down and quit working. So there's a fine line here. If you have a dog that likes food, and you correct it and it won't eat food, that correction was too hard. Obviously not a ouch correction. That's a killed me correction. If you have a dog that's really crazy for a ball and you give him a correction and he won't play for it with a ball, that correction's too hard. So we want to correct at a level where the dog just says, ouch, okay, I'll do it, and not at a level that says, ah, really hurt, I don't want to do this, I don't want to be here, and we want to correct hard enough so the dog just doesn't say, okay, and then goes right back and does what he wants to do. So you have to determine how hard to correct your dog. One of the points that you need to keep in your mind here is people ask me, well, when do I, when is my dog ready for a correction? The dog is ready for a correction when you know 100% in your mind that when you tell him to do something, he knows how to do that command. There can be no question here. The dog has to know and understand the command that you give him. If he then gives you the finger and goes and continues doing and doesn't mind it, that dog needs a correction. If the dog doesn't understand the command, it's not fair to correct him for not following your orders. It's pretty common sense. Dog training isn't rocket science. So ask yourself, does he understand it? Yes, he does. Then he deserves a correction. Then how hard should the correction be? Well, we have to move through the different levels to see where he is. The ouch correction is the level of correction that you want to use on your dog. So the question people are asking themselves is, well, how do I figure out what level is the ouch correction for my dog? That's a good question because corrections and the levels of correction that you need for dogs is not breed specific, it's not size specific, it has to do with the hardness and softness of a dog. I have seen 100 pound 
dogs that require less of a correction than 20 pound dogs. My mother used to have a poodle that required a, a very hard correction to get the ouch correction. Whereas on a soft dog, you may only have to give on a scale of one to 10, a level two or a level three correction to accomplish the same thing. So it's up to you to determine what level to use. How do you do it? The correct way to do it is start at what you would consider a level two or a level three correction. Give the dog a correction and see if it, see if it gives you the kind of response that you want. A dog that when you give it a correction, he just stops what he's doing just for a second or two, maybe gives you eye contact, and then, go, then goes right back to doing what he was doing, that was not a hard enough correction. You need to jack it up to maybe level four or level five. What you're looking for, and what I tell people is, is that you have to give the dog a hard enough correction so that he stops doing what he's doing and does what you want him to do, and the correction can't be so hard that he won't respond to a reward or to praise. In other words, after a correction, when he comes to me and does what I want him to do, and I praise him, his temperament has to come right back up. If I correct a dog so hard, a dog that likes a food reward, if I correct that dog so hard that he won't take a food reward from me, that was too hard. If I have a dog that likes to play with a ball, and I correct him so hard that he won't play with a ball, the correction was too hard. Now with that said, when you move through your training schedule, you're going to find, possibly, that after a few weeks, when you give an ouch correction that you've used for the first two weeks, it may not give you the desired results. So you have to jack the level a little bit. And another very important thing is keep this in mind. The higher in drive that your dog is, the higher correction level it requires. So a dog <coughs> that is just working in the front yard and we're working on the sit command or the stay command and there's no distractions may require maybe a level three correction. That same exact dog in the same exact spot when your wife would come out or your kids would come out and they are a distraction for the dog it may have to have a level four correction or the same exact dog in the same spot when friends come over with kids and maybe another dog, that dog may require a level seven or a level eight correction to stay down when I tell him to stay. So don't forget that. It's very important and I'm gonna repeat it. The higher in drive, the harder the correction. The longer you train your dog, you may have to raise the level of correction. The exception to that rule is in electric collar training. A lot of times, uh, in electric collar training, after you've trained your dog for a while and he knows all the exercises and maybe you had been uh, using a mid-level stimulation uh, and the dog gets used to the collar training, uh, you can tone the, uh, the collar down a little. You don't have to use it so hard. You just may have to nick it at, say, 80% uh, of what you had been using. Now we have to also talk about one other thing in relationship to corrections. If you give your dog a correction, right after you give the correction, when the dog stops doing whatever he was doing that you corrected him for, when he stops that behavior, you need to praise the dog. Remember what I said, dogs live in a black and white world. Just like we mark what we want our dogs to do, we correct the dog at the exact spot, the exact snapshot in time for what we don't want him to do. And when he stops that behavior after a correction, we praise him and tell him, good, that's good. So, when you correct your dog, don't forget this, when you correct your dog, always praise him when he stops doing that behavior. It's a different concept and maybe a hard concept for people to understand because they think, well, I just corrected the dog. 
He just screwed up. Why do I praise him right away? You praise him right away because in the dog's mind, he stopped doing what you corrected him for. So always praise after you correct. I compare it to if you have a boss that needs to give somebody or you a correction and he comes up and he chews you out and he turns around and walks away, leaves you there. Compare that to the same guy, to the same situation where a boss comes up, he chews you out for doing something wrong and then he says, okay, I know you can do better than that. I know you want to do better than that. You just made a mistake. Let's put it behind us and move on. That's how the praise works with your dog. So when you correct your dog and it stops that behavior, that's fine. Good. Good boy. Always praise after a correction. Now we need to talk about how to correct a dog. This is a big thing with new handlers. A correction is a pop on the leash. The way you correct is pop. That's how you give a correction. I see new trainers all the time kind of doing this, kind of pulling their dog. That's not a correction. A correction is a pop on the leash. Pop. Something else to keep in mind is how often to correct a dog. And by that I mean multiple corrections in a row. Pop, pop, pop. Make the dog go higher and drive. When people ask me, well, when should I correct with just one hard pop versus multiple pops on the leash? When you want to take the drive out of your dog, for example, when you, do when you tell a dog to lay down and he gets up, you go up to him calmly and you give him one hard pop, no, down. That takes the drive out of the dog. If you would go up to the dog that, had, that you wanted to do a downstay and he broke it and you went up, no, down, down, down. Multiple corrections make a dog hectic and they make him go higher and drive. In competition uh, obedience, when people are healing their dog and they want the dog to become more animated and the dog is moving away from them and not paying attention, they'll say, no, heal, pop, pop, pop. That makes them come up and drive and the dog will look up and say, what do you want me to do? Or is this better? So there are applications for one hard correction. Sit, stay, down, stay, hard corrections. Take the drive out, one hard correction. When do you want them to come up and drive? You know, a lot of times with pet owners, there are very few circumstances that you want to correct them to make them come higher in drive. Everyone that gets a dog wants to know what kind of a schedule they can use to train their dog. The fact is, there is no roadmap to follow that will result in a trained dog. There are too many variables. The age of the dog, the temperament of the dog, the training history of that dog, the drive of the dog, and the skill of the handler are all factors that affect a dog's training schedule. A training schedule encompasses these areas. When do you train? Where do you train? Who does the actual training? How long do you train? How often should you train? In what order should the training encompass? I'll address these questions now. Motivational training can start as young as eight weeks of age. My video titled, Your Puppy Eight Weeks to Eight Months, shows how to do this. The reason that motivational training can be started so young is that it doesn't involve corrections. So there's little risk of hurting the dog's temperament if a mistake is made. When a dog is ready to start the correction phase of training, it should be five to six months old, occasionally a little younger. The best time to train is when a dog is rested and hungry. This means after he has spent a quiet time in his crate or kennel and after he has gone to the bathroom are much better times than when he's just finished playing with the kids in the backyard. Training before the dog is fed is much better than training after he is fed and training before a dog is taken for a long walk is better than training when the dog comes home. 
if people rescue an adult dog, it's always best if some kind of bond can be made between the new owners and the dog before they start serious distraction training. In the beginning, the best place to train is in your house or in your backyard. These are places the dog is familiar with, and they have less distractions than the local park or your front yard where there are people around. I always pose this question to a new trainer. If you cannot call your dog to you in your home or your backyard, what makes you think you can call him to you in the park when there are dogs and people around? When a dog will perform the necessary commands in your backyard, then it's time to move on to bigger and more exciting places. One person should be the official trainer for the dog. This means one person takes the dog through the learning phase and on into the correction phase. Pet owners need to be very careful with this area of their pet's training. This is where a lot of problems come into play. Once the dog is trained, then other family members can learn to handle the dog. These members should initially be supervised, though, by the main trainer. The reason for this is to make sure that the other handlers in the family are all on the same page concerning what to expect from the dog. It would not be fair for a family member to take a particularly halfway trained dog to the park and expect him to come with recalls when the dog is not even ready to do recalls in the backyard yet. Training sessions should be very short. Two or three minute sessions several times a day are perfect. When people tell me they train their dog for 15 or 20 minutes every night, I can almost guarantee you that their dog does not like obedience training. So this is really important. It's a hundred times better to do several short training sessions a day than one long one. The time between these sessions is determined by what you're training. When we're working on marker training with food rewards, the break between these sessions can be short, 30 minutes. But when the training is focused on distraction and correction phases of training, then the sessions should be spaced out further apart, probably by several hours. What order to train the exercises is a difficult question because, again, there are so many variables. The first thing a new dog owner needs to do is to establish a bond with his dog. I could do an entire training video on building the bond between a dog and his handler, but it begins with one person in the family being responsible for the training, for the feeding, and for grooming the dog. These three areas are the first steps to building a bond with an adult dog that comes into your home. A dog can initially be taught right off the bat to walk on a lead without pulling. If it's an adult dog that pulls, then get a prong collar and a good leash and begin to establish your pack order. This dog will self-correct when he pulls on the lead when you take him for a walk. Right off the bat, pack rules need to be established on living conditions for a dog when it comes into the home. This means no dogs on furniture, dogs eat last, they go downstairs last, they go through doors last, etc., etc., etc. These are all covered in my article titled Dealing with the Dominant Dog. The only advice I can give here is don't underestimate the genetic power of your dog's pack drive. The actual training for every dog should begin with marker training. If you're not familiar with this term, you will be when you get through with the training section of this video. I start with on-leash sit, down, stay, and come training. You will be the one to write the book on the actual training schedule for you and your dog. I recommend people keeping training logs. Get a notebook, write down your thoughts after you train. When you're sitting around at night, think about the issues that came up in training that day. Think about solutions to the problems you saw. 
by the time you're done watching this video three or four times, you're going to have a very good feel for problem solving in dog training.